It's always difficult to be the last person speaking. Um, I know that you are very tired. I am very tired myself, and I can see in all your faces that you just want to have some coffee. I'll try to make it fast, um, and hopefully you will enjoy this presentation. It's a little bit special. I made the entire presentation in Microsoft Paint. So. <laughs> My, uh, my daughter actually told me, Daddy, you have the best job in the entire world because you can travel the world, do presentations, go to very nice places, and then when you come home, you can paint. So I do think I have the best job in the entire world. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the things that the previous speakers did talk about. I'm going to talk about how I hacked my home. Um, this presentation is also a little bit special because the vulnerabilities that I found has not been fixed. I have reported them for over one year ago, but they have not fixed the vulnerabilities yet. So I actually had to censor my presentation because what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some live demonstration. I'm going to hack a device that I brought from Sweden. This is the device. This is the only device I can, I can bring because my suitcase is not big enough to bring a TV. So, who am I? I am David Jacoby. I am a, a security researcher. Yes, this is me. <laughs> um, I work at Security Lab since about four and a half years ago. I joined the company. Uh, I'm responsible for security research in the Nordic region and also the Benelux region. I'm also one of the security evangelists. So I do travel quite a bit and do to conferences and, and meet a lot of nice people. I met in bar. This is, I don't know, we meet at every conference around the world. Last time was in Seattle. Seattle, before that, Dominican Republic. Very nice place. So I'm a security researcher, but I'm also a retro geek. So actually, I'm very, very, very excited to be in Tokyo, Japan right now, because you have a lot of retro gaming things. I do love, uh, for those who can see, Atari. Uh, so I do love all these uh, old computers. I am actually probably one of the few people around the world that still buys VHS tapes and Laserdisc. And yesterday, in, the, in one of the weird shops that I visited, I actually bought five Japanese horror movies. And that's because I'm a very big horror nerd. I love horror movies, especially Japanese horror movies. But that's not why I'm here. I'm actually here to uh, talk a little bit about this. Is there anyone in the audience that knows what that is? This is what I've been doing for 15 years before joining Kaspersky. No one? I've been doing pen testing. <laughs> 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 so, so I have a background doing penetration testing, and in my job, when I was doing penetration testing, all the reports and some of the research that I found led me to this. Um, this is going to security conference around the world. This, <laughs> people think that going to a security conference is because you want to learn things, you want to learn the latest tips and tricks. You want to learn something about security. But it's not. That's just a big lie. That's a big excuse to go to a security conference, because all you want to do is network and party. I can see in your face that you really, <laughs> that you really want to go party tonight. And, uh, and another thing, most of you will not remember the presentations that you have seen today. And that's a fact. That's why it's completely useless to think that you're going to learn things by going to a security conference, because you can just read my blog post afterwards. But anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, let's go back. Before I talk about how I hacked my home, I actually want to talk about what I think IT security is. I know that Karen talked a little bit about this this morning, and I would just want to share my own view and hopefully you will agree with my view on IT security. So we have this guy. This guy is the security officer. And he will tell us that we need to work with security, whatever that means. We have to work with IT security. We have to be secure. But when someone tells me 
that we need to be secure. Let's pretend that I am the technician and the manager is t telling me we have to be secure. The thing is, I get really excited when someone tells me that we have to be secure, because then I have to run penetration tests, I can buy software, I can buy tools, I can do some conf configuration and audits, I can do a lot of things. The problem is, when I try to explain to the management what we're doing in the, to actually build security, we don't really speak the same language. IT guys and management don't really speak the same language, so the management they don't really understand what we are saying. We're talking about fixing buffer overflows, patch management, network segmentation, uh, authentication. This is all the stuff that management don't understand. So they, they look at us and say, we don't understand. But there's one language that they do understand, which is money, the money language. <laughs> and for some reason, it doesn't matter how little money the IT department asks for is always too much. Especially for a company who has not been a victim for an accident. They will say, we're not going to spend this money, sorry. Doesn't matter how little money you ask for. And while we're fighting, what do you think the bad guys are doing? Of course, they are continuously trying to act, attack our systems, they're trying to test our network, and. One thing that we've seen as a trend, they also try to look at our reaction. Because <laughs> they will send exploit code, they will send viruses and trojans, and they will see how our systems react. Do we have a firewall? Do we have antivirus? Do we have proxies? Do we have log management system? Do we have all that? And if we do, yeah, they will customize the attack to try to avoid these systems, okay? And then they just go all in and they hack us, right? They work 24 seven and they try to compromise our network. Maybe they do like in bar, they go to some restaurant and try to hack the, the, <laughs> the payment system. And it doesn't matter, this is very important, doesn't matter how much money you already spent on IT security, for some reason they always win. This guy locked his bike, but do you think it worked? <laughs> right, for some reason, his protection did not work, right? Because the attacker had a new way of exploiting the system. And we don't understand where the attack is coming from, right? <laughs> We will look in our antivirus products or we will look into our log management system and when, if we don't understand how the vulnerability works, how are we going to protect it? How are we going to protect ourselves against an attack that you don't know, you don't know anything about? It's impossible, right? <laughs> this is actually my favorite slide. I love this one. <laughs> okay, so what happened after we get compromised? What happens? We get humiliated. Right? They will publish our emails, our passwords, our database, our sensitive data. They will, uh, everything will be uh, written about it in, in media, in newspapers, and we get humiliated, right? And when we see that our company has been compromised, how do we react? We are a bunch of crybabies. And that's true. We are very childish in our reaction. We get very upset and we almost want to uh, to have revenge on the head attackers. But how do you think the attackers react when they compromise the company? What is their reaction? Well, the bad guys, they like money. And this is important, because all your data, even a simple thing as an email address, is worth money on the black market. Just imagine how much money full access, full administrative access to a network is, how much is that worth? Quite a lot of money. So now we're seeing a trend that the attackers is actually out for money. Not just for fame, they actually want money because they can sell this information. And one of the problems with this is that we don't understand what the problem is. The IT guys is saying, we don't have enough time to fix the vulnerabilities. We don't have enough money to fix the vulnerabilities. We have different priority 
So we cannot fix the vulnerabilities. And the management is saying, why didn't you fix the vulnerability? You should fix this. But if we don't have time and resources or money, how are we going to fix the problem? And if we don't even know what the problem is, how are we going to fix it? Because we in the industry, we have a really big problem. And now I want everyone to listen, because this is very important. As a security researcher, I'm fed up with other security researchers, and including myself, that's trying to predict the future. Do you know how many times I get the question, what kind of threats do you think we will see in the future? It's not relevant, because we cannot fix the stuff that we have been talking about for 30 years, so why should I try to predict the future? If we're still vulnerable, as we saw in the last presentation, and in Inbar's presentation, and I haven't seen all the presentations today, but we've probably seen it in other presentations as well, the vulnerabilities that we are actually vulnerable against is 30 years old. Why should I care about the next generation threats? Think about that. So, the company is compromised. There's always a smart guy saying, we have a recovery plan. We will fix this. I'm very positive, we will fix this. And now they also have proof that they need to spend money and time and resources on IT security. So they try to fix everything at once. They will replace printers, routers, they will buy server servers, they will have consultants, they will do a lot of things to fix the network. But still, if you don't know what you were vulnerable against, how are you going to fix it? You cannot. So we work 24-7 without knowing what the problem is, and we try to fix this, right? We do all these things, but does it help? We have this fantasy or this view on that when we're done, this is how the firewall should be. This is how our security should be. The attackers should just be bouncing off from our system. They should not be able to attack us. And then we have the sales guys, and I'm probably going to be fired for selling this, but this affects everyone. This is, affects all the sales guys, because they will read in the media that this company got compromised, and then they will go to this company and say, buy our product, buy our service, because that will help you. But still, if you don't know what you were vulnerable against, how can you choose a product that works? Some ideas are actually really, really bad, even if I do like this idea very much. <laughs> Some people are just too stupid to actually own a computer. <laughs> and some ideas are actually really, really good. But the problem is that they are selling an entire concept. They are selling a system that we don't really know how it works. How many in this audience uses Automated vulnerability scanning. No one? No one? Automated vulnerability scanning. Sell it? Sell it? <laughs> the problem is that to, for example, be compliant for PCI or some other ISO standard, you have to do automated vulnerability scanning. There are several vendors who are doing this, but just imagine that you have a file or a directory written in your local language. My local language is Swedish, and the Swedish word for password is lösenord. Just imagine that I have a file on my web server called lösenord.txt containing all my passwords. There is no automated vulnerability scanner in the entire world that will find that file, because it looks for password.txt. It does not look for Swedish words or Japanese words, or German words, or Spanish words, or Italian words. So even that you buy a security product, it might not work. If you don't understand what the product can do for you, and you don't understand the limitations with the product, you will never be able to build security. And they're also quite difficult to manage, because they're meant for technicians, they're meant for IT guys. So when you do get the product, Sometimes it's very difficult to implement it in your network. But after a while, when you spend time implementing this 
product, you think that you have the perfect security, right? You think that you have something great because you fixed everything. But if you don't know what the vulnerability was in the beginning, how can you fix it? This guy buys a very nice lock for his gate. <laughs> Oops. Really? He didn't think that through. So what do you think happens after he implemented his security? If we didn't know what the problem is, how can we buy or use or fix our problems? So we get hacked again, right? <laughs> I don't know why there are so many Asian people in these funny pictures. <laughs> but listen to me now. <laughs> Listen to me now. I'm here to talk to you about how I hacked my home. This is important. This is me hacking my home. <laughs> so why did I choose to do this? Why did I choose to hack my own home? It sounds like a very bad idea. But the thing is, I was looking, in, looking into network connected devices and I was searching for the term Internet of Things, which I don't like either, but I was searching for it and trying to see what kind of other research has been published, uh, has been written about. And one very common uh, research is um, this guy who finds a refrigerator or researches a refrigerator that is connected to the network and it allows him to send spam from the re refrigerator. It's probably a story that most of you guys have heard. The other story is about two uh, American researchers, Charlie and Chris, who hacked a Toyota car, right? The problem with these attacks is that the exploit vector, the attack vector, is extremely stupid. For example, the payload the reason why you could compromise the car, or the, what, what happened when you compromised the car, is that you can, for example, change the, the level of fuel in the car, you can uh, turn things on and off, like uh, signals, and you can also turn off the brakes and, and those things. But if you want to kill someone, do you want to be inside the car when you turn off the brakes? Because the attack is that you have to use your own computer with a cable, connected to the car, have a special written program that will allow you to shut off the brakes. But you have to be inside the car when that happens. So once again, do you want to be inside a car when you turn off the brakes? No. Not if you don't want to commit suicide, but it's, a bit, it's, a, it's quite a difficult ex exploit vector, attack vector. So I thought, instead of focusing on these products, like a refrigerator or a car, I decided to look into my own home. What do I actually have in my home right now? Because I don't know about you, but I personally do not have a refrigerator that's connected to my network. Do you guys know anyone who has a refrigerator that, that the refrigerator is connected to the network? No. So if I find vulnerabilities and I talk about something that no one uses, how, how effective is that? So I decided to see, what do I have in my home? And I'm a security nerd. I've been working in the security industry for many, many years. And I thought, I don't have that many items. So I thought, how do I actually get these devices? Normally, you go, you go to a retail shop, um, and you buy a TV. And there's a salesperson trying to sell this TV to you. And I don't know about Japan, but in Sweden, they always try to sell the TV with the most functions. If it has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and can make coffee and can clean your floor and can do the dishes, then it's a good TV, right? So we buy these devices without actually knowing what we're going to use all these functions for. Because ask yourself, if you would buy a new TV tomorrow, would you buy a TV with Wi-Fi or without Wi-Fi? Most people will probably buy with Wi-Fi, right? And then I ask you, why do you need Wi-Fi? Streaming is not very popular in Sweden yet. And if you do have some kind of streaming service, it's through the digital box and not through the TV directly. So the TV itself does not really need Wi-Fi. 
But after we bought this device, the sales guys, this is the sales guys at the bottom, this is their reaction when we leave the store. Because they sold a more expensive product for us and they made more money. And what did we get? We get actually a more vulnerable device. But okay, hacking my home, like a boss. In my home, I had so many devices, which was a surprise for me. I had two TVs connected to my network. I had two Blu-ray players connected to my, TV, uh, to my network. I had a satellite box connected to my TV. I had an Apple TV. I had a PlayStation 3. Uh, I have a network router. I have two storage devices. And I actually have a Commodore 64 connected to my network. Don't ask me why. I just have it. <laughs> but that was over 11 products that's connected to my home network. And this is product which I have zero control over. So I started to look into these different devices. And I started with my two network storage devices. And I was just thinking, can I find any vulnerabilities in these devices? Within 20 minutes, I had remote code execution as root on the device. And as we saw in the previous presentation, this device was vulnerable to some very similar vulnerabilities. You send an argument, and the argument was passed to a system function, which executed everything as root. No authentication, no nothing. And we in the security industry, once again, need to take more responsibility what we talk about and how we help people to improve security. Because we in the industry has been talking about doing backups for 20 years maybe, 30 years. And what we're doing, we're actually taking, creating a backup from our laptops and storing them on a device that more, that's more vulnerable than the computer itself. And isn't that strange? that we take what's very, very sensitive and we store it on a device that has no security whatsoever. So we need to take more responsibility on how we teach people security. After this, I decided to see, is there anything else I can do? Can I find more vulnerabilities? And it was very logical vulnerabilities which allowed me to download the entire configuration file of the device. So even if the device required a username and password for getting access to the administrative interface. You could just download the configuration file, and that's the password in clear text. Since it's running a small Linux machine um, with GCC, with Perl, with Python, with Bash, I have a lot of possibilities to store files, because it has two terabytes of hard drive, so there's no problem storing files. Um, so what I did is I downloaded a small Perl script, which is just a small backdoor, which connects from the device out on the internet to an IP number that I control, which means that once the device is, is infected, I have access to the internal network at any time. Very simple, very simple stuff, um, and very effective. But this was from my own local area network, right? And people asked me, so David, this is, this is still stupid, because you have to be inside the network to exploit this. This is not true. Yes, it was on the local area network. But there are very many ways where you can exploit this from the internet, even if the device is not listening on any port on the internet. If it's only listening to internal IP numbers, you can still exploit this. It does require some interaction from a device that is connected to your network. For example, an I, uh, a tablet, or a mobile phone, or a computer. Any device that can interpret JavaScript can trigger these vulnerabilities. And I'm going to demonstrate that today. Bef before we do that, I just want to demonstrate how I was able to, uh, to access the configuration file. I will not disclose you the exact vulnerability, but this is just a small demo. So. I made a small program called the NAS Hacker, um, which allows me to download the entire configuration file. There we go. The username and the encrypted password. Very simple to crack these passwords. And if I want, I 
I can ex also get code execution. But once again, this is from the local area network. How do I trigger this remotely? So when looking into the vulnerabilities, I found that 90% of the bugs was located in the PHP code. There were so many running daemons that actually I don't have had time to look into all these, but um, there was a total of 22 vulnerabilities in just the PHP code. Um, I had a slide with all the technical details, but I had to remove them for privacy reasons. But I can tell you that all of the 22 vulnerabilities in the PHP code was the same vulnerability as we saw in the previous presentation. Everything was just sent directly to a system function in 22 places in the PHP code. So this is my demonstration on how to do this remotely. And this, this type of attack can be used to attack any device on your local area network, not just my storage device. So this is me in the top corner the square guy, and then we have the internet, we have a firewall, and I have my devices behind the firewall. One of the attack vectors that I'm going to demonstrate right now is that I send you an email or a Facebook message or something with a link. You know how we normally use social media? We click on, on links to funny videos, and we look at the funny videos, and we press like, and we do all that stuff. So just pretend that I'm sending a link to a website with a funny video. While you're watching the video, something's happening in the background. Because when you click on the link, you access my website. And on my website, there is this funny video. And this also affects any iPad, iPad or tablet or, or mobile phone, not just computers. And when you are looking at my video, there is something magical happening in the background. It's very simple. What I'm doing is I'm enumerating internal IP numbers on your network, because I am pretty sure that I can guess your internal IP number range in your home. I'm pretty sure it's 192.168.0.0, or 192.168.1.0, or 10.0.0.0, right? If I can guess this range, I can guess IP numbers that's inside that range through a JavaScript. And all these devices that we have connected in our homes, most of them have a web server. And by connecting to the web server and looking for a specific path, for example, to a picture, I can enumerate the device. I can see this is a storage device. This is a TV. This is a Blu-ray player. This is a printer. This is something. Because maybe the logo for the company has, a, um, has an image stored on the web server, something that's static, something that I can measure. Like, if this image exists, I know it's that kind of, kind of device. And if I know what kind of device it is, it's very simple for me to send my exploit code. And I thought that we're going to demonstrate that right now. Hopefully it works, because it's 100% live, so I really hope it works. On this machine, I am pretending that I am a, an attacker somewhere on the internet, listening for incoming connections, right? And I'm going to my, my website, where I have this funny video, right? While we're watching the video, see, I even included a funny video. Look at the top left, scanning for device. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. There we go. We found a vulnerable device. What if I just want to? Look at the configuration file. Or let's say that I want to have command execution on this device. Look at my terminal here. I now have a connection, and I didn't do anything. I just visited the website, and I got a connection. Let's do it one more time. And 
just look at this screen now. Now in the background, we're doing the same scan over and over again. It's looking for the internal IP number. As soon as it finds the device, it will send the exploit code. The machine will connect to the internet to my device that I control, my command and control server. I have full access to this device now. Very simple. And this is while you're watching a funny video on the internet. And this works from any device, tablet, phone, computer, as long as it's connected to the same network as you are. So what about the other devices? What about the TV that I had? I was looking into the TV and I thought, now when I compromised the storage device, can I use the storage device to somehow access the TV? Because you know, some TVs have network sharing, they can read uh, files from a network share. They have uh, some smart applications, Skype, Twitter, Facebook, all these. But the problem is, have you ever tried to use a TV on the internet, like going to YouTube, with the normal remote that you get from the, remote, remote, the normal remote from the TV. It totally sucks. Because it's like you, you're steering the mouse pointer, very, very difficult, and eventually, sometime if you're lucky, you, you're able to click on the search field, and then you have to type something to search for on the remote. It sucks, it takes so long time, it's not very convenient, right? So having Wi-Fi or network access to the TV might be completely kind of use, useless. But I thought, is there any way I can attack this? And I found nothing. I found no attack vectors that worked. Until one day when I was running a packet sniffer and I was just trying to access the, the menus on the TV. And when I was accessing the menu on the TV, I noticed that the TV sent some really strange traffic to the vendor's websites. Because what happened is that when you access the menu, all these smart applications is being downloaded because they want to have the latest version directly from the vendor's website without using HTTPS or any signing or any certificates, which means that you could do perform a man in the middle attack on the TV. And I tried to do that, and I noticed that, yes, it is possible. I can inject whatever kind of code I want on the TV. I noticed that the TV was running very, very, very old software, even that the TV was pretty new. And may I ask you, how often do you buy a new TV? Once per year? Twice every second year? Every fifth year? Me personally, I buy maybe a TV every fifth year. And if I told you that you had software vulnerabilities in your TV right now, would you go to the local store and buy a new TV? No, we have a problem that even that we know that we have vulnerabilities in our, our network connected devices, we're not doing anything about it because it's a financial problem. We cannot afford buying a new TV. It's too expensive because every time there's a vulnerability, should we buy a new TV or a new storage device or a new printer? It's impossible. But I decided to, to do a demo. Does anyone know Borat? Have anyone seen the movie Borat? Yak Shamash, you know Borat? <laughs> I decided to see if I could inject some code into my TV. So I injected a picture of Borat and now I have a picture of Borat in my TV, which totally sucks. <laughs> but the problem with this research is that I couldn't continue it because I wanted to find code execution vulnerability on the TV. I couldn't continue it because I paid from my own pocket for this TV. And if I, if I continued the research, I was afraid that I will break the TV, which I paid a lot of money for. And do you know how difficult it is for me to explain for my daughter why she cannot watch Scooby-Doo because daddy worked on the TV? No, that will not work, you know? She will be very upset when I, when I broke the TV because I needed to work. So I couldn't continue, so I contacted the vendor and asked them, can you please provide me with more information, more technical information about this device? And the answer I got was, you seem to be a smart guy, you can probably figure it out yourself. 
So, work in progress. <laughs> I'm still working on trying to find um, both vulnerabilities and some solutions on how to fix this. The vendors, of course, in all the vulnerabilities, the vendors has been notified with everything. Um, and in my routers, I know that we just saw a presentation about routers. Um, I did not find the same vulnerabilities as these guys. I found something completely different. I found hidden functions within the router in the administrative interface. And my first question was, who has access to these functions? I'm logged in as the administrator on my device, but there's someone who has even more access to this device than I have. I also noticed that the device was running very old software, including the UPnP protocol, uh, daemon. So maybe the, my router is vulnerable to the same thing as, as the previous speakers just mentioned. And I don't know why I have three ghosts or a snake in this presentation, but I just like them. They were nice. So is my device backdoored is my main question. If someone has access to my device, who is that person? Because it's not me. This is a screenshot of the device. I tried to blur the, the product name. But as you can see, in the left menu, you have different selections and different, different sub-menus. You have, for example, broadband con connection, and the first value after broadband connection is DSL connection, and then you have internet services. So it should be the, the first value should be DSL connection, and the second value should be internet services. But this is not the case, because as you can see, I'm. Maybe you cannot see it, but what I highlighted in red, it says WAN sensing. But in the menu, there's no such thing as WAN sensing. Here it says web cameras, but in the menu, there's no such thing as web cameras. And in this menu, you have maybe 10 different submenus. The first one, the second one, the third one. The problem is that the first one is maybe not the first one the first one might be the fifth one. Because you can simply just modify some of the values and you can access menus in the router that's not in the menu list, even though I'm logged in as administrator on this device. I personally think that this is something that the ISP, the internet service provider, actually restricted me from doing because they don't want to give the users full access to these devices. I think that's the case. But if they have access to other functions, how difficult do you think it is for an attacker to get access to the same functions? Well, I was researching this, something very, very strange happened. I don't know if this is possible in Japan, but in Sweden, this happened. I got locked out from my own device. Somehow they probably found out that I was doing some crazy research on their device and locked me out. What happened then is that they sent me a new device and a bill on 50 euros. I have no idea how much that is in Japanese yen. <laughs> it's quite a lot of money. Can you, do, can you do the conversion real quick? 50 euros. Uh, 65, Say again, 65, 65, 6,500 Japanese yen. There came a bill that I had to pay for a new router. I don't know why I didn't order a new router, so I actually refused to pay that bill. And that was a mistake for me, because what happened when you, do you know what happens when you refuse paying bills? <laughs> People don't get happy. <laughs> so there come a new letter saying, if you don't pay, we will come and take something worth that money from your house. So of course I had to pay that money, but I didn't give them my router. Crazy people. So what's my point? What's my solution? Because I can stand here all day, talk about the different vulnerabilities that I found. I do have a point. My manager asked me, so David, you spent about three months finding vulnerabilities in software, and we're an antivirus company. Why do you spend three months doing all this stuff, all this research? The problem is that we as an industry, we don't know how to do security. We don't get it. We think we know how to do security, but we don't get it. One problem is going to security conferences like this. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people, a lot of security researchers are doing very, very, very nice work, but they're afraid to submit a paper to a security conference because they think that the only thing that they have to talk about 
is super new, very high tech, super advanced exploitation techniques. I don't know if you agree with what I'm saying, but a lot of people are afraid to talk at a security conference because they don't think their research is good enough. We have to somehow break the ice. We have to somehow allow more people to talk about research. We also need to allow more people to talk to each other. We need to allow people to report vulnerabilities to vendors because what happened is that I reported all these vulnerabilities to the different vendors. There was one vendor, only one vendor, that replied with a positive email saying thank you. Two of the other vendors said, we don't even believe you that these vulnerabilities are real. I had to do a web, WebEx session, sharing my desktop, actually exploiting every single vulnerability with the development team from this vendor for them to understand that the vulnerabilities that I submitted to them was 100% correct. And even during the WebEx session, they said, your vulnerability does not work on our device. And the problem is that they didn't know how to exploit it on their own device, even that I gave them a full working exploit. And this is the problem. If the vendors don't even know how to, not how to exploit things, but if they don't know how to review or quality assure their own products, we have a problem. One of the vendor actually told me, we're not going to fix this vulnerability because it's in a consumer product. So we're not going to fix it because the support life cycle of consumer product is about six months. So even if you buy a brand new device, after six months, that device will not get, receive any up updates. If it does receive updates, how do you know it's security updates? So we have malware, we have attackers, we have hackers, we have people who is actually going after these devices. We have more and more connected devices. I had 11 connected devices in my own home. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's quite a lot of devices. We are seeing attacks already, and it's super easy to exploit these vulnerabilities because they are so stupid and so trivial. Even as the, the previous presenter said, this is super easy to exploit. It's not, this is not ninja magic. It's very, very simple. And maybe the most, or the, the most important part is that there's no real solution for it. If you cannot update the device, you cannot update the device. What are you going to do about it? I tried to come up with some kind of solution, but the solutions are pretty stupid. It's the same thing that we've been talking about before, change the default password, uh, try to update it if it's possible. Then what, what else can you do? The only thing that I thought of that you can do more is maybe put it on a different network segmentation, to put it on a VLAN. But if I would ask my mom to put her TV on a different VLAN, what do you think she will reply? No food for you. No food for you, David. No Swedish meatballs. No, no, no. So we don't have a solution for it. And we as a community needs to work together to come up with this solution. And we as a security researcher community, which means me and everyone else, also need to start talking about security threats that's relevant, that's right now, not try to predict the future, because it doesn't help. We need to start fixing the security stuff that we are vulnerable against right now, today. And the stuff that we have been vulnerable against because in the future, my prediction is that we will still be vulnerable to the stuff that we talked about for 30 years in another 30 years, because we don't know how to do security. And when I was reporting all these vulnerabilities to the, to the vendors, I'm going to end my presentation with a small image on how they reacted to me. And this is very important, because if they react like this to me, why would I ever want to submit more vulnerabilities to any vendor? So look at this picture and I say, thank you so much. <laughs> this is a response from the vendor. <laughs> now party. No more presentations, party.